This is my screencast for the last chapter, chapter 9. So the first thing, it says note this final exam. Sorry, let's go through the table of contents first. I'll just go right through the chapter, uh, just the same sections that uh, are covered <coughs> in the chapter. So the first thing is uh, note the final exam. So let's see, tonight is Sunday. I might be able to write it tonight, but I'm certainly going to work on it tomorrow. This exam is going to be a timed exam on Blackboard. So you'll see an announcement about it, and you have until the end of next week to do it. Uh, try to get it done this week if you can. Um, and I believe I'm going to set it to be um, an hour long, um, although we'll see how many questions I put on there. It's likely just to have six questions on there, just like there's six chapters. So um, I'll probably have more to say about that on the discussion board later tonight. Okay, so let's get to um, section... 9.1, these perfect engines are impossible. So it's interesting that um, a lot of thermodynamics books will actually cover this material first, um, sometimes well before some of the other things that we have covered, certainly uh, before doing entropy, I have seen quite often. But the way that this author does it, he really wants to talk about um, these uh, perpetual motion machines. And okay, so the first perpetual motion machine um, these are the ones that are clearly and obviously not possible. They violate conservation of energy. Um, just all of a sudden you're able to just go and go and go, no friction, nothing like that, or you just energy appears out of nowhere. Um, the trickier ones are these ones that violate the second law. Um, let's see, the system gains energy to do the work and hence gains entropy, but it does no work. But it does work, therefore it doesn't lose any entropy. Um, and it to be back in the same state, it would have to spontaneously lose entropy. So let's make, sh make sure you understand, you know, an example that um, that's tricky, right? I mean, it seems like, well, there's energy um, in the ocean. Let's let's suck that energy up and then make our make our boat go. Um, if that's all you do, the engine um, violates the the notion that entropy has to at least stay the same, if not increase. So again, we have to be very careful what we mean by the system. In this chapter, what we're talking about the system is the gas in the piston, is the easiest way to say it, okay? So the gas in the piston is the thing that's doing this. Um, and so it would suck energy from a hot thing, and when it does that, it gains entropy because it just gained heat. Um, and then it does work. Remember from the last chapter, a very, very important um, thing from the last chapter is that if it does work, it doesn't lose entropy. So quasi-static work um, doesn't change the entropy of a system. It's very, very important to realize. Um, and then, so boom, it gained entropy, doesn't lose any, so it would have to spontaneously lose some. All right, so um, let's go to section two, real heat engines. And I'm really just going to discuss this from this hyperphysics um, webpage that I like a lot. So we'll go there. Okay, so here we have the typical example of a real engine. Real engine says, that's fine, suck some heat from a hot reservoir. Whoopee you, you got some energy, that's great, and you're going to use it to do some work. But the point is you have to keep a little bit of that energy that you took from the hot reservoir and you have to give it away to a cold reservoir. You do that because what that does is that enables the uh, entropy books to be balanced. Essentially, this was a gain of entropy, this is a loss of entropy, um, and that's how you can bring the system back to its original state because the system has to be able to repeat over and over and over again. So a couple of things that we um, get out of this. Um, there's this efficiency. It's how much work do you get out of it? divided by how much heat did you have to pay for. That's usually how I consider this hot reservoir. We usually pay to make things hot. So whether you're talking about a nuclear generator, or you're talking about a coal-fired plant, or uh, your gasoline engine, you usually pay to make things hot. Okay, So that's usually down here in the denominator, and you're trying to get as much bang for your buck. So let's take a look at the efficiency of a heat engine. Um, and I really thought that this quote in the book was was uh, was very interesting, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about that on the discussion board. It says the derivation on the previous couple of pages is one that one of those that every educated person should know and understand. Um, the point here is trying to make people understand that no engine can ever be perfect, no heat engine can ever be perfect, and we want to try to understand what's going on there. Well, what is the uh, entropy change here? Well, the hot reservoir loses a little bit of entropy because it gives up some heat. Okay loses, so therefore negative, and it's it's at a hot temperature, of course. And the cold reservoir gains some heat, therefore gains some entropy. Okay, So we need um, the total change in entropy. Remember that the system, the gas in the piston, has no change in entropy over, um, uh, over one cycle. So we're just going to look at the entire global thing here, which is the, the gas in the piston and the hot 
reservoir and the cold reservoir. So the total change in entropy of the whole deal is this one plus this one. Well, we need that to be greater than or equal to zero. So all you do is you take this, you add it to that, being very careful of your, your negative signs and your positive signs, and you say it has to be greater than or equal to zero. And then when you rearrange that, you find that the ratio of heats has to be greater than or equal to the ratio of the temperatures. Um, which is uh, fantastically simple. And then we go to the efficiency. We know that the efficiency is work over the, the heat. This is bang for your buck here. Um, work is really just the difference between the hot and the cold. Uh, if we go back to this picture, the work is always the different hot minus cold. So we have this equation here. Um, if you always make sure that you get ratio of heats everywhere, you know that if you any t where you have ratio of heats, this is a big hint for the homework, by the way, Always make sure you have hint ratio of heats because then you can replace it with ratio of temperatures where you have to make sure you're very, being very careful about the sign here. And so you would get this expression here. So that the efficiency, the maximum possible efficiency of a heat engine is given by this expression. So what are some consequences of that? Well, the typical consequences are um, that and we'll, for, we'll go through the three that the book talks about. We've got uh, the first one, any change in temperature, any change in temperature can be used to get work. So any change in temperature can in principle be used to make a, use a little piston, connect it to the hot thing, let it grow, connect it to the cold thing, let it compress, and you get some work out. Um, so that's very important. Number two, if you increase the, the difference in temperature, if you look right here, if you increase this numerator, you get more work. Um, and then the last thing is energy waste is inevitable. So entropy is forcing us to dump some energy into the cold reservoir. So next if we go to refrigerators here. Sorry, I'm just going to scroll this down as far as I can. Uh, that's not where I wanted it to be. Let's go back up. There we go. Um, we've got refrigerators and so we have this expression. Um, back to the hyperphysics again. Let me just this over a smidgen. There we go. So um, here's a schematic of how a real refrigerator works, and here's the reservoir idea. So we just turn everything backwards. If you want to suck some heat from a cold thing, you would typically do that to make it even colder. Well, it turns out that to balance the books, you have to do some work to do it. So you got to plug refrigerators in, and it, what sucks is you're dumping that heat that you just sucked out of something that you're trying to make cold. You suck some heat out, dumping it out into the out, outer world, the hot reservoir, the room, for example, for a refrigerator. But look here, you always dump more heat into the hot reservoir than you actually sucked out of your can of pop. And uh, so you, you, you can tell your kids that they should not leave the refrigerator open in the summertime because you're actually going to heat up the room. They're not going to make it colder. So let's understand how that works. How in the world would you get heat to leave um, a cold thing? Well, we know There's only one way to do that. You have to put it in contact with something even colder. So what you do is you've got the inside of the refrigerator here, and you've got this really, really cold stuff in your pipes here. And so it's even colder than the refrigerator. So heat leaves this and goes into this here. So that's fine. But here it goes into an expansion valve. Um, and that expansion valve, it actually gets hot. And, and what you can do is make it even hotter than the room. So if this expansion valve and this compression are the two most important parts of the refrigerator here. Okay, So um, it's, what happens is you, you had a very cold thing, and you gained a little bit of heat. You expand it out, and it gets very, very hot. So hot, in fact, it's hotter than the room. Well, if it's hotter than the room, then heat spontaneously wants to leave. And after it leaves, then you have to compress it back again to being a liquid. And once it's a liquid, it's nice and cold, and you can repeat. And this is the big idea here. So you're sucking heat out of something, dumping it into the room, but you're always dumping more heat into the room than you're sucking out because of entropy. Um, and then let's just talk about the Carnot cycle, last thing here. So um, the Carnot cycle is, this is just the last part that we're going to talk about. With the Carnot cycle, um, the idea is, okay, we want to make an engine that approaches that very, very best efficiency. We know that 
Um, the best efficiency is going to be if the entropy change is exactly zero, so that the entropy change of the hot reservoir is exactly balanced by the entropy change of the cold reservoir. Normally, it's a little bit worse than that. So what do we use? Well, adiabats sound good because then there's no heat flow. So these blue guys here, these adiabatic expansion, here's an adiabatic expansion, come around here, here's an adiabatic compression. We know that there's no heat flow, that's just quasi-static work, so there's no um, entropy change at all there. And so what's left is um, we have these isotherms. So if you have heat transfer um, between two things, if they're actually at the same temperature, so the entire thing is done at a constant temperature, then um, we know from some homework problems in the last chapter that yes, the, the reservoir loses entropy, but the thing gains entropy and they're exactly balanced. So there's no net entropy change there. Now it turns out that here on these um, isotherms, that the only way to have temperature change, uh, sorry, the only way to have heat flow between two things when their temperature is equal is incredibly slow. You should know that heat flows much faster um, if there's a gigantic temperature difference between two things. Um, so the problem is that um, while the entropy, so the Carnot cycle, no, no net entropy change in the isotherms, and of course during the adiabats no entropy change either, there's no net entropy change at all, you get the very best efficiency. We already know what the very best efficiency is. It's this. And of course this is a nice website because it allows you to plug some things in. So that's about it for heat engines. Um, obviously we'll, we'll discuss more about this um, in the homework and on the discussion board.